Amen. We begin a new sermon series today called Love Practically. Love, love practically. Just for a few moments, just a, show me just for a quick word of prayer as we, uh, as we dive into our sermon series on today. Ah, it's got such a simple word. Four letters. But sometimes it takes a, takes a lifetime for us to figure out how to do it well, what it looks like, how best we receive it. Sometimes it takes us years to even confirm if we are even worthy of love or not. And so, God, I pray that over these next few weeks, that as we talk about such a simple but complex word that you would challenge us, but inspire us. Show us something new. Remind us of what you've already showed us. Help us to, to look into every area of our lives and see how we may give it, how we may receive it. Because God, regardless of, of where we are in our lives, we can't do love without you. For these are the prayers of your people who love you and whom you love. In Christ's name we pray, amen, amen, amen. I want to just give a title, just give a title this, What Matters Most. If you're taking notes, just write that down. What Matters Most. Because as we start today with our new sermon series, we're really going to be looking at the practical implications of love. Sometimes we know we know what it means, we know the theory behind it, but what, what are the practical implications of love? In fact, there are no areas of your life where this does not apply. In fact, I think it's a really fitting discussion considering last Sunday was the celebration of Christ's resurrection and it was the ultimate display of love. But then we learn in 1 John that God is not only described as being loving, but God is love. I mean, God is not just powerful. God is not just all-knowing. But God exists as the embodiment of love, and love exists as the embodiment of God. So as we go throughout these next few weeks, don't just limit the conversation to romantic love. Don't just use this as an excuse to bring somebody here, right, right to talk. No, no this, is, this is more than just romantic love. In fact, the Greeks had several different meanings of love, different meanings that describe different kinds of relationships like friendships or family members or love for God and from God. So this will be something that you can use in every area of your lives. If you got friends, you can use this. If you have children or grandchildren, right, love has practical implications. If you, got, if you got neighbors that you really can't stand, if you got some classmates that get on your nerves, if, if, if you've got some pets at home, right, you, you're going to need this sermon series because love has practical implications. There are no relationships that you have in your life where this does not apply. But for the best of us, let's be honest, for the best of us, even the most romantic, love is easier said than done. Somebody say amen. Amen. That's why Paul had to write to this church in Corinth about love. I mean, it almost seems like he's preaching to the choir. I mean, he could have he wrote this letter about anything, but he's talking to the people belonging to this church about love. In fact, it doesn't matter how long you've been in church, if you're just starting out, most people have heard those words from 1 Corinthians 13 because somebody invited you to a wedding and you got dressed up and you went to the wedding and the officiant or somebody stood up and read 1 Corinthians 13. How many of you have ever been at a wedding and somebody read 1 Corinthians 13. Amen. See, look at that. You're already experts at 1 Corinthians 13, right? Because, because we've all heard it before. Now, Paul is not writing to unbelievers about love. 
I mean, that would make sense. He's not addressing people who've been in prison or incarcerated. He's not addressing the Roman authorities or religious elite. I mean, those would have been the first ones on our list. But he is addressing a church who's struggling with their expression of love. He's trying to help them rethink and reimagine and refocus how they live out their faith, in particular, how they live out the practical implications of love. Because apparently their values have now started to shift. For them, love started being an elective rather than an acquired value that they needed to obtain. They started to place more of a priority, watch this, on their gifts, on their talents, They started to place more emphasis on the outward expression of those gifts. They placed a higher emphasis on things like speaking in tongues, prophesying before people, having all knowledge, mountain-moving faith, and even extreme levels of sacrifice. But here's what Paul says. Paul says you can speak in tongues. Paul says you can prophesy before people. Paul says you can have faith that moves mountains, but if you don't have love in your life, You have absolutely nothing. Here's what's interesting. Paul's assertion is almost odd because he spent the last chapter in 12 talking to them about how important their gifts were. I mean, he spends a whole chapter talking about them using their gifts in the body of Christ. He tells them, just as a body, though one body has many parts, but it's many parts for one body, so it is with Christ. Your gifts are important. Even so, the body is not made up of one part, but many. Why? Because your gifts are important. But in fact, God has placed the parts in the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. Why? Because their gifts are important. He spends an entire chapter telling them to use their gifts in the body of Christ, and then says... If you don't have love, all of those gifts and talents mean absolutely nothing. I mean, let's make it plain. Do you know what this is? Let's make it plain. Let's make it plain. Do you know what this is? I mean, for those of you in Indianapolis, you might know what this is. Do you know what this is? Sort of, sort of. I'll give an air high five to anybody who can guess what this is. Come on, somebody guess. Oh, man, leave me air high five. Come on, come on. Hey, you probably heard the last sermon. Okay, good one. Right, right, right. Yeah, so, so this is a picture of Tom Brady's supposedly last touchdown he almost threw. Right, and watch this, watch this, watch this. It auctioned, it, it, it auctioned off, and it started, it started at $100,000. And then it went up. Somebody paid a half a million dollars for Tom Brady's supposedly last touchdown he almost threw. Why? Because a day later after he bought it, Tom Brady changed his mind (laughs) and said, I'm coming back to playing football. Now here's what happens. Here's what happens. When he announced that he was returning, the value of the football dropped by 90%. Somebody say, help him, Lord. (laughs) One essential element lowered the value. The value of the thing depreciated because what was essential was now absent. Same ball, same game, same quarterback. Nothing about the ball had changed, but the one essential element completely changed its value. It depreciated overnight. Now, I'm not saying I'm a Tom Brady fan here in Indianapolis. I'm not saying that. But what I am saying is that the same principles apply to our own lives. I mean, think about the things that we value over love. We value stability. We value the acquisition of wealth and power. We value education. And that's what Paul is speaking to today. Paul is giving us an opportunity to reimagine and rethink and refocus our priorities and values around love because without the, without the presence of love, it lowers the value of all of those things that we think are important in our lives. Same gifts, 
but it depreciates. Same opportunities, same person, same talents, same outcome, same accomplishments, but the value, it depreciates overnight if the presence of love is not there. So here's how it happens. Here's how it happens. Here's how we get to a place where love is not the most important thing. It gets here because what we replicate is what we reward. I mean, the kind of behaviors and values that get repeated are those that overtly and covertly get rewarded. Is this making sense? So, so, so be careful what you reward. Be cautious with your congratulations. I mean, it's not hard to see why people in Corinth started to value these outwardly displays of gifts. It's not as though love was not important, it just wasn't essential. I mean, you can see why these people would have been well-known and celebrated for speaking in tongues and prophesying before people and people who had mountain-moving faith. You can see how these would be the people that would be celebrated and well-known in their society. And think about the many ways that we celebrate people in our own culture. I mean, if I'm a bomb actor, I win a what? Okay, let's try this again. If I'm a bomb actor... I win a what? I win an Oscar. If I'm, if I'm bomb on Broadway, I win a Tony. If I'm, if, I'm a, if I'm a great musician, I have an opportunity to what? To win a what? Right. If you are good at what you do, there's somebody in your profession, there's somebody in your culture. If we are good at something, our culture rallies around the opportunity to celebrate people who are good at what they do. It rallies around people who are very gifted. I mean, we celebrate people with extraordinary gifts and talents. I mean, these are the people that we, we allow to lead. We see them on magazine covers. They write books on being highly successful. They get paid to speak. And then, and then often we look past their personal lives. Why? Because they are great at what they do. Somebody say do. But here's the problem without ever saying it. It's an expression of our reward system. And sometimes our values change if you're great. We give you power, we give you influence, and unknowingly we reward a particular set of values and behaviors and it gets replicated because we replicate what we reward. In fact, one of my earliest failures in ministry and leadership, and I've made many, it was limiting the people I chose in leadership. I mean, it took me two years at my last church to see that I set an unhealthy culture of who could serve in leadership. It was a kind of, I mean, we, we, we were 12 miles outside of New York, so, so these, these were high-powered individuals. They were high-functioning. There were doctors, lawyers, and former college presidents. I mean, there are people who worked on Wall Street. Many of them had great jobs and great influence. And here's how the Lord convicted me. I was preaching a sermon about how God chose 12 ordinary people from Galilee. And I talked about how they were unlikely choices. And the sermon was getting good to me. I mean, me, you see, 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 you all think I'm loud and animated, but this is actually the subdued version of myself, right? You are, you are, you are, you are getting the subdued, Javon. I mean, this was, this was one of those sermons where God is speaking, and this was one of those sermons where I'm getting happy and I'm getting excited. I'm talking about God showing up on the shores of Galilee and choosing people that have been overlooked, choosing people that were unqualified and how the Lord shows up in the Galilees of our own lives and God chooses unsuspecting people and aren't we glad that the Lord just stops by Galilee every once in a while? I mean, the sermon was getting good to me, y'all. But I realized I was preaching to myself 
See, this is why sometimes I have a bone to pick with the Lord. Like, can you, can you, right? Because I realized I was preaching to myself and not the congregation. Because afterwards, we had a church council meeting, and the Lord reminded me that nobody that you preached about your sermon is around at the table. They're the same people you talked about and got happy about. They're nowhere to be found around the table. So the Lord convicted me, and we had to figure out how do we change our behaviors, and it was we had to change what got celebrated and rewarded in our congregation. It wasn't bad, but what had happened is we had developed a, we had developed a process and a culture where so many people that were on the shores of Galilee never saw themselves as qualified because that's not what we rewarded. We rewarded a particular lifestyle, and that developed a culture. That's what got recognized. That's what got celebrated. But not for Paul. For Paul, Paul says our talents are not an adequate substitute for what we are lacking in our hearts. That's why, that's why for Paul, you can't sing your way out of trouble. That's why for Paul, you can't preach your way out of an addiction. That's why for Paul, you can't serve your way out of stress. That's why for Paul, successful ladders don't cure problems of the heart. So here's where the challenge comes in. So here's where the challenge comes in. The challenge comes in here. If I have nothing without love, then it's not about what we do but why we do it. Because the question now is not a matter of outcomes, but it's a matter of motivations. Because sometimes we can have good moves, but the wrong motivations. And Paul is moving beyond our gifts and moving to a deeper level of commitment. Paul, I mean, is highlighting some very prestigious gifts. He's highlighting speaking in tongues. Right, this, this supernatural language that many thought that believers could communicate with God. Some believed that it, it described a person that could communicate the gospel in different languages. He's talking about prophesying and having all knowledge and faith that can move mountains. Then he highlights a person that, that sacrifices everything. But these are things that we do. Somebody say do. They are important, and the church needs supernatural communication. The church needs proclamation and faith and miracles. But the, and the church is based around sacrificial living. But here's where Paul puts the challenge. Paul draws a distinction between what we do and why we do it. As a reminder that God is not impressed with what we do if it's done for the wrong reasons. Because good moves can be done with the wrong motivations. I mean, I mean, it's possible to be martyred for faith in Christ without caring about the people that Christ came to die for. It's possible to benefit from someone's gifts and not recognize their humanity and treat them with dignity because admiration is not a substitute for love. It's possible to love using your gifts in front of people and not love the people who receive your gifts. It's possible to give sacrificially and not care about the people that the money or the resources will impact. It's possible to serve people and not see them. It's, it's possible to be a full member of the church and be active in all the ministries and come every time the doors open and be the meanest, rudest person in the room. I mean, not this room. I'm just saying, I'm just saying the room just in general. It's possible. A level of giftedness is not an indication of what's in our hearts. Paul says you can have all of these things, but if you don't have love, you don't have anything. That's why love now becomes the label. I mean, Jesus has been talking with them about love throughout their whole ministry. Even on the heels of his death, Christ tells his followers, a new command I give you to love one another. Love one another as I, has, as I have loved you, so you must love one another. And by this, 
By this love, everyone will know that you're my disciples, not by how gifted you are, not by what you can do, not by where you work, not by how you worship, not by what church you belong to, but people would know that you are a follower of Jesus Christ by how well you love one another. So hypothetically speaking, hypothetically speaking, I'm married to a certain individual Hypothetically speaking, I got to go home. Hypothetically speaking, <laughs> I'm married to an individual that, 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 that has a strange desire and love for purses. <laughs> Hypothetically speaking, and I've yet to, to really understand or comprehend why this individual cares so much about purses? I mean, she asked, hypothetically speaking, she asked for them for birthdays, for mothers. Don't you amen for, for, for birthdays. <laughs> I said you got some support in the house. I said you got some support. She asked for them for birthdays for holidays, for Christmas. I mean, she has a roll in her own closet of nothing but purses. It's red purses, blue purses, work purses, going out purses, small purses, large purses, handheld purses, purses with the strap, purses for the kids, purses for church, purses to go on trips. She got a purse for every single occasion. be clapping for that. <laughs> Y'all supposed to say, help her, Lord, help her, Lord. <laughs> so I've made two commitments in my life. I made two commitments in my life. I made a commitment to give my life to Jesus Christ and to never buy another single purse ever again. <laughs> now, there are a few brands that she absolutely loves, and one brand in particular has a lifetime warranty. So this is what I got to do to get responses from a congregation. Huh? <laughs> Talk about person, right? So, so well, watch this. One day I was given the responsibility of taking one of the persons back to the stores to go get the strap fixed. Sounds simple, right? But she gave me no receipt, no proof of purchase. She bought the purse years ago in a totally different city. I was worried. So I got to walk into this store with this purse and ask them to fix it. I ain't got no receipt, no proof of purchase, and this going to go over well. So I was given this assignment, and I went into the store, and I calmly said to the lady across the counter, I mean, I'm a, I'm a, I, am, I am not in my element. I'm in the purse store. I'm, I'm, I'm all out of my element. And I said, I'm sorry, but I've been sent on a mission from my wife to get the strap fixed. I don't have any receipt. I don't have any proof of purchase. And she said, no problem. She opened up the purse and started inspecting the inside. I noticed that she never looked on the outside. About 20, 30 seconds went by, she put a tag on it and says, sir, your purse will be ready in a few hours. Finish your shopping and come back. I was shocked. So I ain't got no proof of purchase and no receipt. So I just, I just had to know. I said, how, did, how in the world did you know that this was your product? She said, well, I just simply looked inside the purse. That's all we do. I look inside for the stitching. I look to see the quality and how it was made. And I look at the information on the label. Because even though something might be identical or counterfeit on the outside, 
I can tell just by looking at the label if this is an authentic product, I can tell that this belongs to us by looking at the label. In fact, I can tell the year she bought it in and I can tell what store she bought it in. You see, the value was determined by what? Internal inspection. It's the quality that exists on the inside that determine the worth and authenticity of the purse. Now, I am not endorsing you to go out and buy purses or handbags. I'm not doing that, right? That's, that's not what I'm doing. But what I am doing is reminding us that what makes us recognizable to the world is not what we do on the outside, but it's about what shows up on the inside. Because anybody... Anybody can counterfeit what's on the outside. Anybody can preach a good sermon. Anybody can sing a good song. Anybody can serve. But it's about the motivation behind what we do. It is about what shows up on the inside. But we often, we often assume that what we do on the outside makes up for what we lack on the inside. We sometimes live as though people that should give a pass look the other way and forgive our internal shortcomings because of our display of our gifts that happens on the outside. But love becomes the label. What makes us distinctive to the world is not by what we do on the outside. It's not our gifts. It's not our talents. It's not speaking in tongues. It's not mountain-moving faith. It is not those things that we do. But somebody should be able to look inside of our lives and look at the stitching and look at how we were made and look at how we were created and look at how we live our lives. Our love is the distinctive factor to all of the other counterfeits that are out there. It's not about our gifts. Because Paul, says you can have all the gifts in the world. You can prophesy before large crowds. You can have faith that moves mountains. But if you don't have love in your life, you have absolutely nothing. But in the presence of love, In the presence of love, it makes all the difference. Now you're speaking in tongues, now your gifts, now your talents. It makes all the difference not in what we do, but the motivation and spirit behind why we do it. It's love that matters most. That's why you can use this in every single area and relationship in your life. Because God has blessed you all with so many gifts and talents. But it's love that matters most. Won't you pray with me? God is such a simple word. We write poems and sing songs about it. But it's so hard to live. Sometimes it's even harder to receive it. That's why, that's why we can't truly be a people who are called to show love without you because you are love. And it's when we draw closer to you. It's when we are more connected to you. Such a, such a simple word. But sometimes it takes a lifetime for us to figure out how to do it well. Sometimes it takes some bumps in the road. Sometimes we fail. We don't always do it right. And that you are gracious enough to not only show us how to love, but every day is an opportunity to love better than the day before. So, so free us from the temptation of acquiring more gifts and acquiring more things without the presence of love in our lives. 
because one day our gifts will fail our jobs will fail our health will fail the one thing that will remain is your love never fails simple word but God we can't do it without you these are the prayers of people who love you and who are loved by you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen.